Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to be talking about uh, my experiences in West Africa. Um, there's a very uh, poignant picture here the, uh, of a burial in West Africa, which was one of the uh, biggest causes of the spread of the virus. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, a, a report which came out on the 21st of October quite recently. And uh, this is a, an extract from the WHO Situation Report, which is a weekly published article which gives you all of the statistics on the number of cases that have been detected in an ongoing outbreak. And this is the kind of canonical resource that media and people use to, to, to track the outbreak. And on the 21st of October, we got this, we got one came out uh, which talks about two new cases that had been detected. And they used the phrase, and genomic analysis suggests he was not infected with the strain, uh, with the strain of Ebola virus responsible for the most recent cases. And uh, this was the data that we'd fed back from our, from our field lab in, in Guinea. And this was the first time that any genomics data has been used in, a, on, in an ongoing outbreak of a viral pathogen. So this was, this was very gratifying. So I'm going to go back to the beginning now. Um, how do we get to that stage? Well, in March last year, we had a serendipitous um, meeting with a guy called Miles Carroll at Public, at Public Health England, Port and Down. And he had just finished a sequencing uh, project where he'd shipped back 180 RNA samples for sequencing in Liverpool. And we had been developing a protocol to do viral uh, genotyping on MinIron. And he said, well, if you can do it, then I'm going out in a week and a half, and you can come with me. So I rapidly put together everything that, that, we, that I needed. I got my vaccinations, six vaccinations, um, got my visa from London, and just about made it uh, to, to, the, to the airport with Miles, and we flew out to Guinea together. And um, this, is, this is the equipment that I assembled. So this is a, a Pelican case. Uh, these are kind of hard cases that are used by the military and things like that for, for kind of precision equipment that needs to be protected. Uh, it's got three laptops, a PCR machine, a dry block, and a, and a qubit, which is a benchtop fluorimeter. And down here, I had two polystyrene boxes. The left one is the, kind of, is the chilled reagent, so that's the minion flow cells and the beads. Uh, in the right-hand uh, box, I had the frozen reagents, which is the, the kits, which is MAP5 when we started doing this. And, um, in this one, I, I, uh, I put, cold, I put uh, packs that had been chilled. In this one, I packed uh, frozen cold packs. And once I had put, got all that together, this is the kind of size of the luggage that I took with me. This is actually at Heathrow Airport, showing the two, bottom, uh, the two cases at the bottom. That's just my clothes. And if you were to compare that to uh, a conventional platform, such as the Iron Torrent, this is the, uh, the setup that the Sanger guys took to Sierra Leone. Um, to do iron torrent sequencing out there. And I'm not trying to have a go at them or anything, but this is just the, uh, the size of the, the equipment that they, that they needed to do that with a, with a kind of a conventional machine. And I arrived uh, at Donk Hospital, which is, uh, was built in the 1960s in the capital of Guinea, Conakry, by the Russians. It's, um, it's kind of crumbling now, and it doesn't really have um, even um, a reliable infrastructure such as power and water. They did, however, manage to sort us out with a room to work in. And this was the lab once I'd set it up. So I had my um, min-irons with the two computers there, the fluorimeter. These are the reagents I took out, tips, plasticware, and a thermocycler for doing the um, RT-PCR reactions. So you can see it only needs about two meters of bench space to get this set up. And this was, um, this was the moment where we set up, where we, where, where we kicked off the first sequencing run, let alone nanopore sequencing run in Guinea. Um, and this is Dr. Masuma, uh, Dr. Masuma there pressing the, uh, pressing the button. This is the WHO um, gilet that they give you, which is uh, designed to um, allow you to be recognized. It's, it's a kind of protection mechanism. So the, the strategy that we used was a, a, an RT-PCR amplicon sequencing method. So the Ebola genome is uh, RNA virus. It's about 20 KB long. We, I took with me 38 primer pairs, which, which basically tile the entire genome. Um, I took 38 pairs, That's, they generate a, a 500, a, um, average 500 base pair fragments, but I wanted um, to have the flexibility to use shorter, to generate shorter or longer amplicons when I was there. In the end, we ended up settling with this um, 11 reaction strategy, which, only, um, which was uh, about 2 KB per amplicon. Um, the first few, run, few runs that I did in Guinea, um, 
this is a, a validation run we did in the UK, but the first run I did in Guinea was a 19 reaction one. Then I, then I uh, realized I could amplify longer fragments, went to an 11 reaction one, and then introduced a gap, so I changed it again. And we ended up with this strategy, which we settled on, which gave us 98.4% coverage of the Ebola genome from 11 reactions. And I, saw, I, I created a, a tarball, um, g-zipped it, and sent it back to Nick in Birmingham. And he started and using the hotel Wi-Fi. This is the hotel I stayed there, the Palm Camayen in Conakry. And he, he started analyzing the data. He, he thought that it was looking really good. Um, later on in the uh, trip, I then investigated using a mobile data connection because we needed to, it was all very well doing it in, in, this, in this nice hospital, uh, sorry, in this nice hotel. But really what we wanted to do is add a sequencing facility to an existing diagnostic laboratory, in which case we needed to be, uh, we needed to be able to do this. Um, in the field. So the test with the, with the 3G hotspot looked good, and we fed back all these results. The WHO were really impressed by the, uh, the trees which we were able to provide, which showed, um, which showed the, the major lineages that were circling in Guinea, and they actually, uh, they actually built this, this sequencing center here, the, uh, the, this porter cabin, basically, with a few desks in it. All the, all the equipment was moved over there, and this is in a place called Koya, which is about two, two hours outside Guinea. And if you don't believe me, there's the jungle there, right out the front door. So over the, over the next um, eight months, we did a uh, 142 min iron runs. So sorry if you haven't been able to get any flow cells. And uh, we originally started off in March and April with a fairly small um, coverage of the total number of cases. But over time, our coverage um, got higher, and actually, um, over over uh, May through October, it was really a, it, we were really sequencing every isolate that we wanted to. The reason we did we didn't sequence all of these isolates in May, June, and July is because they were from family clusters, and it, it was pretty obvious what the transmission route was. This plot here shows you the time from sample collection to sample sequencing for 122 runs, and you can see that while we're getting set up there, there was, there was, there's a delay because these are, these are kind of stored, stored uh, d uh, RNAs. But for the majority of the tail end of the outbreak, we were able to sequence them um, within one or two days. And our actual record was 18 hours from, from, the, from being bled to receiving the genome sequence. The time taken to do a run, on average, was only 45 minutes. Um, this is a kind of collector's curve for, for, an, for a few of the runs that we did, just showing you the kind of coverage that you can generate in, in, in the time. And we were, we were generating you know, 350x coverage in some cases in, in under half an hour. This is a, a plot showing the passing 2D by run. Um, and as you can see, there's some variation. The best, the best 2D we got was 68% passing, which with MAP5 is, is pretty good. Um, but it's interesting to have such a large data set because we can, we can make these interesting comparisons. And all of these runs are in the European Nucleotide Archive, so you can download these and look at them. This is a, a plot showing the quality and number of reads for 100, 122 runs as well. And, if, and I've zoomed in on some of these to show that you can see that in some cases we are getting above uh, the last kind of uh, line is, is 80%. So we were getting up to about 90% identity in a lot of these runs. Um, there is some variation though. And this is, I'm not going to go, I'm, I don't have time to go through the whole bioinformatics pipeline, but the key, the key points are that we use, um, we, we use the metric order base call and then do two rounds of, of alignment, firstly using BWA, then doing um, um, local alignment optimization using margin align, and then again using event uh, align, which is a, a tool built by Jared Simpson, who's the kind of self styled um, squiggle superstar. Who did? Who developed uh, these tools? Um, and we've, I'm going to show you this the, this this brilliant nanopolish um, variance module which he built for doing for doing this genotyping method. And then we would build consensus and make some trees. Nanopolish the nanopolish variant module is an expansion of the um, HMM that he built for polishing our genome assemblies. And the the way it works is it gets candidate. Uh, SNP positions from the base alignment, so it pick, it, it, anything with a, a greater than 15% uh, variant frequency from the base alignment, it, count, it, 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 it stores as a candidate sequence, and it groups them into um, groups of 10 or 100 base pairs, and then generates a list of candidate consensus sequences, iterates over them, and it tests 
which, the, um, which consensus sequence the variants best support, and then, and then chooses that. We, we originally started doing this um, with the FIVMA model, because that was, that was uh, the, the base calling pipeline at the time. We then moved to the SIGMA model, um, and then applied this back to all of the old MAP5, MAP5 data. And as you can see um, in this plot, which shows the support fraction by count, using the SIGMA model, we get much um, cleaner genotyping. The, the model be much better represents the data, as you can see from the, the fraction of, um, of reads which support the variant on the right-hand and the right-hand plot. This is a, a beast analysis of um, 800 uh, publicly available Ebola genomes. And then the, the panels show the, the, the genomes that we sequence. So they fall into two lineages, um, which are uh, Guinea 1, which is, a, which is um, closely related to the index case from, from Guecadu in Guinea, and Sierra Leone 3, which is um, a, m a much more distant lineage, which is related to the cases in Sierra Leone. Um, this is a map uh, showing the prefectures of Guinea. And the, the, the leaves are colored by the prefecture. So you can see that there's strong evidence of, of transmission from prefecture to prefecture, which you'd expect. And also, these squares, um, these squares at the top of both of these panels show isolates from Sierra Leone, which were picked up in other surveillance sequencing. And so you can see here that we've got evidence of cross-border transmission. And when we reported this back to the WHO, they, they didn't realize that cross-border transmission was actually a problem. And they investigated this, and they actually managed to um, stop these cross-border transmissions. There wasn't any, any more after we reported this. Um, this is a, a, a plot showing um, an, an, one of the epidemiological kind of stories that we, that we managed to tease out of the data. Um, case one was a taxi driver uh, who, who, had an, who, who died and had an unsafe community burial. He gave uh, the, the, the authorities realized that, that this was a problem after cases three, four, and seven all, all presented with illness, um, who were all members of the same family. Uh, this, this, so the initial case led, led to 11 cases, and subsequently a total of 36 cases, um, all, from, all, from this, all from this one case. And uh, the gene, this is an ML tree showing the, showing the, uh, this, the relationship between the, those genomes. And you can see that the, um, geno, the, geno, the, the geno, genomics data um, accurately represents the epidemiological hypothesis there. For, for the two chains. Again, this is a, an in, this is a website called Ebola.nextflu, which is built by uh, Trevor Bedford and Richard Neher. It's a really nice tool for, for viewing uh, and sharing genomics data online. Uh, and you can see all of the isolates that we sequenced here are colored in. And then this represents the, re the remaining public data. So I'm not going to spend too much longer. Uh, the things that we are excited about are potentially doing um, more, more field sequencing. So the things that will make this easier would be things like isothermal amplification, reduce the need for a PCR machine. Um, there's a kit, a one-tube assay called TwistDX, which we're, we're looking at. We are mainly interested in 1D-based uh, library preps going forward. Mainly that's because our squiggle-based analysis tools um, use 1D um, events. So the, 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 the 2D um, library prep is, 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 is slightly unnecessary, and it, and it adds a lot of complexity. Um, we're interested in RNA um, sequencing. Um, we now have an offline base caller for 1D reads, which has been built by Jared. We have offline genotyping. So in theory, you can now go into the field. You can do the entire bioinformatics pipeline on the, min, uh, on the MinIron laptop. Um, and if you've got your, your uh, database of, of, of existing sequences on your laptop, you can actually place it there and then. And uh, um, obviously, this lab in a Pali case idea, I've got a, a gun in this one because I'm in the US. So these are, these are the uh, uh, acknowledgments. Uh, I haven't got time to go through them all, but these all, all of these people uh, made significant inputs to the project. It wouldn't have been possible without them. Thank you. OK, uh, questions for Josh? Um, we were able to amplify 6 KB amplicons in the best case scenario. So we would probably then put those into the 1D prep, aiming to get as longer, as longer fragments as we could. The team that used the ion torrent, uh, yeah. how, did their, how did their results compare to yours? How quickly were they able to get the data out? 
um, they they were slower. They were less responsive because they were they were using an AmpliSeq panel and they batched them up. So what they tended to do was collect samples over over a while, uh, over a period, and then sequence them as a batch. So they weren't really providing that data um, in, su in so such a real time, time way. Yeah. 